This is a review of Doom 2016 that released on Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PC, where I played it. It will contain full spoilers for the entire game, so if you plan on playing it, I suggest doing that first. But there really isn't much to spoil. It's a first person shooter, so the story is bare bones and the combat isn't much more than you would expect. I don't think watching this video would outright ruin your experience if you're playing it for the first time but it will definitely have an impact and make you notice things that you should perhaps not be aware of and might make you think differently about some parts of the game or the game as a whole where you otherwise wouldn't have. Now allow me to provide my background with the Doom series, or my lack of one. The only exposure I've had to anything Doom related is what adds up to viewing a few minutes of gameplay over my entire life and two bars of music from the titular theme. Therefore, my observations, perspectives, and suggestions approach this game essentially as a new one and a standalone game. I will not be comparing the original Doom to Doom 2016 in any way. For convenience's sake, I'll refer to Doom 2016 simply as Doom from now on. So with that in mind, let's get started. I don't want to give the impression that I didn't enjoy this game because in fact it was a quite pleasant experience. I recently went to get my hands on an FPS because I've had a hankering for one. Doom scratched that itch very well, but a call for this type of game didn't blind me to what can be improved. A quick note before I continue with the gameplay. I'm writing this bit here on the word fun after I've actually finished the script because I noticed that I use the word often and it should be justified. I never use the word as a filler. It was intentional every time I used it, but because it has almost become a dirty word recently, I want to explain. Fun isn't the only valuable barometer by which to assess a game's value or competence at game design. It doesn't seem like a word the people that were engrossed in a heavy rain would use, or maybe Dark Souls, or maybe Sudoku. But I used it so many times in this video because that is the primary emotion that id were trying to elicit from players, so I used the word fun whenever I thought that they were successful with their endeavor. Other words like satisfying and enjoyable are grouped in with fun. Different games warrant different diction, but the reason I use this diction is because it fits the goals of the developer and the experience of the player. Now let's actually get started. Movement is something that Doom nails perfectly. Almost. The character movement feels fast, but just like the guns, feel weighted. It's not like id recruited Usain Bolt to assess movement speed in the game, but neither does it feel like they hired Snorlax. Navigating about an area feels fluid and natural. The almost qualifier from earlier comes in for the jumping. This is the one aspect that feels heavy. There's nothing wrong with the jumping arc, but reducing the gravity on the jump by even 3% would eliminate the heavy feeling and match a two-dimensional planar movement style. There's also a slight problem with the clambering. It doesn't work 100% of the time. It was an excellent decision to make it an auto-clamber. Removing this extra step from navigating an environment allows a player to focus on killing. It's reminiscent of how Ocarina of Time removed a jump button and simply performed it automatically when approaching an edge. It works out perfectly, except for when it doesn't. This isn't a fault of the auto-clamber though, that lies in the level design. Some edges simply appear to be clamberable, but aren't. Either the object wasn't designed well enough to convey to the player that it can be clambered upon, or the programming wasn't perfect on that surface and led to a detriment. Fortunately, this is the extreme seldom case. I can recall that happening to me twice over an entire playthrough, but both times unfortunately caused a fatality. This is an unacceptable feature to have in a game like this, but I can mostly ignore it just because it happens so rarely. The pace of the guns match the pace of the movement as well. Moving too fast to use the guns effectively or moving too slow to feel constrained are not issues. When moving around at high speeds, it's very important that each type of enemy is easily identifiable as to not confuse them with one another. Shadow of the Colossus has 16 bosses with no other enemies in the game. This means that developers explored the concept of the Colossus in every unique way that they could and stopped when they weren't unique anymore. This is how Doom approached its enemy design. There are 15 standard enemies in the game, 18 including bosses. The developers made matters simple by attributing one characteristic ability to each enemy and visually designing the demon around it. The Keiko demon fires a round plasma orb from its mouth. The demon is a floating spherical ball with one eye. A revenant fires missiles at the player. 
So what does it look like? A standard looking possessed human with huge rocket pods on its shoulders, and is also a tall, lanky demon. Those are just some examples, but I'll give one example of a boss. I won't describe it, but I'm certain you can imagine what a demon called Spider Mastermind would look like. I bargain that it is impossible for a player to mistake one adversary for another in any circumstance. In addition to visual diversity, they also have skill diversity. The skill of one demon does not feel indistinguishable from any other. There are flying demons, rocket demons, charging demons, trigger happy demons, none are repeats. This makes them engaging to interact with. I once heard in an interview with a Bungie employee on the Halo games a piece of design philosophy regarding shooters. The guns must be fun to shoot and the opponents must be fun to shoot at. Doom captures this sentiment very well. The Doomans must be so fun to shoot at, in fact, that they shoot at each other. This phenomenon is called monster infighting, and it's shown to the player on multiple occasions where enemies will be fighting each other before the player gets involved. The player can actually incite the monsters to fire upon each other by baiting one into the line of fire of another. The receiving enemy will turn to the offender, ignoring the player, and seek revenge. This is called retaliation, and it makes combat much more dynamic. Although realism isn't necessarily a cornerstone of Doom, it adds believability to the enemies because they can get pissed off about their friends hurting them. Sublime enemy design is no use if the theater in which to interact with them is dysfunctional, but that is not the case for Doom. Each stage feels different. I use the word stage because that's simply what the engagement spaces are. Every bit of ammunition, health, rune, and piece of armor is meticulously placed in a very particular location. The player is in a rotunda, with enemies, with replenishments. But this works to the game's benefit because the fewer things that have to be actively thought about in a fast-paced action game, the better. As many elements as possible should be abundantly obvious to make the whole experience smooth. Between these battle arenas are corridors most of the time. This is where a dilemma sneaks in. Under other circumstances, I would excuse this basic level design progression saying that it's a welcome break from the action of the battle arenas and allows the player to wind down some and also prepare for the next big encounter. At least on the standard difficulty setting, it's simply not the case. The encounters are generally too easy and short in duration to warrant the amount of break that's granted. I thought I was going to be running around like a madman, narrowly avoiding death perpetually. I anticipated having many heart-pumping moments trying to juggle all of the incoming stimuli. Games generally suffer when peaks and valleys and difficulties aren't handled correctly, and this is a case where it isn't. There is some dynamic regarding combat and non-combat areas, but there is no dynamic within the combat times themselves. Fighting either in hell or on the bases offers no distinction because every combat encounter feels the same, and I attribute this to the mix of demons for each encounter. The cast for each area fought in features about the same diversity of enemies. For example, there is no part of the game where one arena has many low tier enemies and the following one has few high tier enemies. Each encounter is roughly balanced between high and low difficulty enemies. Because of this, everything felt all the same, even the bosses. To use the most poignant illustration, when I defeated the final boss, Spider Mastermind, the first thought I had was, okay, what's the second form going to look like? After several seconds of the cutscene played, I realized there wasn't going to be one. It ended in a whimper. There is no give and take during this boss. After unloading my entire ammunition supply of one weapon into the folds of the flesh, I selected whichever weapon I felt like using next, aimed at the brain, and kept firing. Far from captivating. Usually a good implementation of boss design is to test what the player has learned up to that point, at least in the case of this game. In the case of the final boss, it should challenge everything the player has practiced over the course of the entire game. Spider Mastermind could have been a tutorial boss. If the game actually shipped out with that being one of the first enemies in the game, I would not have second guessed it. The only internally unique thing about the final boss was electrifying the ground and being forced to clamber onto a pillar. But what do you do on the pillar? With limited movement, are you forced to correctly time jumps to avoid taking damage while also trying to deal damage? No. Are you required to leap from one pillar to another, attempting to pay attention to where you're landing and also what Spider Mastermind is doing? No. Are you asked to avoid electrified pillars to jump on and seek safe ones? 
and while doing that, attempting to jump on a path that the boss is following you on to walk into electrified pillars dealing damage? No. There's no variety in this fight. Even in the boss model itself, there is no variety. In no way is the classic combination of nature and machine represented by a colossal brain and a mechanical suit implemented into the fight. Perhaps the player could damage parts of the suit until all parts are destroyed, temporarily rendering the brain vulnerable. Nothing like this is done. This boss fight is a synecdoche for enemy encounters throughout all of Doom. Monster design is beautiful, but they're so unintelligently used. Placing standard demons in predictable combinations and not including any originality or innovation into boss fights is wasted potential at best. Although I praise that the arenas being meticulously crafted was a good thing earlier, nothing is done to the environments to vary the gameplay. The exception is an area with floating platforms, while the remainder of the areas are really just a somewhat different from each other combination of landings at two or maybe three different altitudes. All floors and walls are treated the same. In the room where you're destroying the cooling tubes for Vega, it would make sense to theme the room around the cold. What if there was part of the floor that was ice, and it behaved like ice would in most any other game that has had ice, faster but less controllable movement? But the player could bait enemies onto the ice and they would slide and bump into each other, temporarily staggering them. In some cases of a small percentage, this would incite monster infighting. Or there could be smaller cooling tubes scattered around the arena and the player would attempt to shoot them when difficult demons wandered near them, temporarily freezing them. Something like this seems like a blatant chew-in, but wasn't done for some reason. Hell is hot, so why wasn't at least one part of the campaign exploited so that there was a sun or heat source of some variety that inflicted damage and the only way to avoid it was staying in the shade like Planet Haystrom in Mass Effect 2? No actual mechanics are included in the supermajority of fighting arenas. If you could imagine every arena as simple geometry rendered in grays, how many of them would be truly unique? The amount of wasted opportunities for simple insertions of theme level design is disheartening. The blind but one thing that does fill me with vigor is the sound design in Doom. Every sound provokes a tactile feeling. I can feel the terse vibration of the assault rifle when the missile pod opens, and I can feel the click of the combat shotgun when it zooms in. It wasn't uncommon for me during non-combat segments to continually tap the left trigger on my Xbox One controller and listen for the chain gun to slowly rotate and then snap into place on the next barrel, followed by another tap to listen to each partial rotation like a leaking faucet. The sounds created when interacting with something after pressing the melee button was satisfying every single time, without fail. This translates over to the demons as well. If a projectile is coming your way, you know it. The whirl of the fireball from the imps and the screeching from the lost souls when they're homing in are distinct. Even among mass chaos, the entire soundstage of the battleground is comprehensible because everything is identifiable. And the soundtrack had some real bangers in it and had me going whenever they played. The sound design is one territory where I can't find much fault. Except in the music. Before I get flogged, let me qualify that statement. The music is superb, but there's one consideration that also contributed to me being underwhelmed and was my main complaint about the game as I was playing it. I can safely say that I've never been underwhelmed by a game simply because I knew two measures of music that will be in it. The titular theme was absolutely wasted, totally abhorrently squandered. I wish I could think of a more vitriolic way of saying that. In Skyrim, they used the Dragonborn theme whenever the player was fighting a dragon. It was repeated within the game multiple times. I'm not saying whether the effect was successful or not, but they made an attempt at an efficient and intelligent use of the theme. One game that does do this successfully is Mario Galaxy, where a modified version of the main theme plays after getting a star. Try to guess the only times it was used in Doom. Finding secret dolls and after a mission finished on the mission stat screen. I genuinely tried to think of a time where it could have been more wasted and couldn't. 
I wanted to be listening to this track while viciously tearing apart demons in the most visceral way possible. I was so disappointed when I discovered I wouldn't be listening to it while slaying enemies. Even the way they implemented the titular track was a waste. When finding a secret, those two measures play, but it's a compressed, lossy version of it like they tried to cram it into a Game Boy Advance cartridge. It fits the action of finding an upgrade, but it's frustrating to hear the waste. At the end of Mission Screen, the main tune is so distorted and overshadowed by the other instruments that I don't know what to say anymore because thesaurus.com is running out of synonyms for disappointing. As Doomsday put on the helmet of armor and the peripherals of the visor were visible, the first thought I had was Metroid Prime. Would the camera in this game be like Metroid Prime? Would it be like seeing through a visor as Mr. Doom like in Metroid Prime? All of these thoughts were racing through my mind in the second before the outline of the visor disappeared and became like every other first person shooter, a floating head with no legs. It wasn't like Metroid Prime, but I was really hoping that it would be. Perhaps I'm just ignorant on the topic, but I've yet to see a game that treats a helmet wearing character like Retro Studios did in Prime. Let's look at how that game did it so well. In Prime, Samus does not feel like a floating head without any feet or legs. What appears on the screen is a response to what is happening in the environment. Killing little creature bugs close to her spits their green guts on the screen and then it slowly slides down. If she gets too much bug guts on her visor, she's temporarily blinded. Walking through the steam of some broken pipes pointed in her direction will fog up the visor. If an explosion nearby is bright enough, she will see her reflection in the visor, and if the player turns immediately after an explosion, her eyes are seen moving in the direction of the turn. The HUD slightly moves around when Samus is turning, jumping, and moving, as if her head is actually independent from the armor and is moving within the helmet. Those are only some examples. An exorbitant amount of detail was put into this single aspect and it really feels like Samus, and therefore the player, is moving through an environment. She is acknowledged as an entity within a world. The surroundings in the player are connected through Samus. It strongly reinforces the theme of a single soul on a lonely planet forced to overcome hardship and trial. So then the question becomes, what does Doom do to reinforce the player the type of environment that Half Doom Prince is in? But that's a loaded question. It assumes that Doom has an obligation to represent environmental conditions like Metroid Prime does. Just because Doom can have a camera like Prime, that doesn't mean it should. The first question should be, does it benefit the gameplay and the experience the player has to have a responsive visor? Like many things, maybe. Both positions are adequately argued, and I'll demonstrate that now. In favor of having this visor, it could reinforce that Doombledore is just a marine going through this gauntlet of torture. The hell sequences would feel even more like hell if guts and mists of blood appeared on the screen. This would also offer a contrast to the sterile nature of the facilities. It might not be consciously understood by the player, but it would have a subconscious influence. The bobbing of the HUD would match the concept of literally going through hell as a stressful situation because the slight movements would be out of his or the player's control. There are plenty of opportunities for explosions to expose the faint description of Doomguy's countenance. It would make the player feel like a person in an environment rather than a levitating pair of eyes. On the other hand, Doom doesn't need this and would in fact distract from the core gameplay loop. The game is about going around killing demons with awesome guns, and adding another layer between the player and the enemies would complicate a matter that should be simpler. Doom Tays Inferno doesn't even have a name, that's because there was never a name for the Doom Marine because it's supposed to be you, says John Romero, the original Doom's co-designer. The simple effects currently in the game are plenty sufficient to induce immersion. There is the dirt particle effect and motion blur. Doom is about a player playing a game. My mind holds sentiments from both of these camps, but I find more problems in the latter defense. Firstly is the assertion that the Doom Marine is supposed to be you. Even in the very first game in 1993 is the face of the Doom Marine as well as his full body depiction on the box art. If I'm not a muscular white man, how's that supposed to be me? The contradiction starts even before the argument does. 
I'm not a blonde white woman, but I never felt ostracized by Metroid Prime whenever I saw Samus in a cutscene or in the reflection of her visor. Colanders hold water better than this argument, but that doesn't negate the fact that I agree partially with the sentiment that Doom is about a player playing a game. The inclusion of the responsive visor, however, trumps the player playing a game argument. Even in its present status, the dirty screen doesn't contribute to any sense of immersion because the screen treats dirt as if it's on a camera lens, not an inch away from a face on a visor. And motion blur is an artifice in the way that it's implemented. Motion blur acts on the entire screen and not just peripherals. Of course, humans experience motion blur in real life. If you move your hand quickly back and forth in front of your face or watch the blades of a flying helicopter spin, you're observing motion blur. So unless your head is spinning and your eyes are locked into position, you're not going to see motion blur in the center of your visual field. But I'm not aiming this as a criticism to Doom necessarily because it's impossible to simulate real human vision on a screen accurately. Our eyes don't even move smoothly. They snap from one point to another unless we're tracking a moving object. You can notice this by moving your finger slowly in a circular motion on a table and tracking your fingertip. But if you look from the bottom left corner of your screen to the bottom right, your eyes will snap. In fact, I experimented with having motion blur on and off and actively decided to leave it on because I enjoyed it. It makes moving around and shooting demons feel more like running and gunning, which is one of the primary appeals of Doom. I'm not going to apologize for the tangential rant there, but to wrap it up, adopting some or all of the aspects of what made Metro Prime so successful in this department would certainly be an appreciated detail that would enhance game feel and a connection to the environments which is important because there's a juxtaposition of the real realm and the hell realm as well as the disgusting demons. I don't find the story interesting enough to describe or analyze the entire thing. If you want to know it, you can read a plot synopsis online. But there are some points where it interferes with the gameplay in a negative way. There are two times where it's egregious, but the most obnoxious occasion is when you're trapped in this tiny room with your weapon down. You're in this room that's no more than 4x4 four four feet listening to an exposition dump for two and a half minutes. I know it doesn't sound like much and that I'm becoming petty, but when there's nothing to do but stand, it feels like an eternity. I want you to try something. Find a clock or an analog watch, sit down, and stare at the second hand until two and a half minutes pass. That's what it feels like being in this room. For those of you that have played Metroid Prime, it takes five times as long to be in this room than it does to wait for Meta Ridley to come back down from its dive bombing sequence. I eventually started spinning and looking up at the light. I just want to shoot things and watch them explode. Let's talk about upgrade systems. There are two in Doom, one for weapons and one for armor. Points are gained for guns by engaging in combat successfully, and they are gained for armor by finding once life-filled suits of armor. Many other games have the following problem and Doom is no exception. Uninteresting upgrade systems. I used the points out of obligation, but anytime I had to read some text and compare it to other text and think about how it would translate to in-game benefit, I shouted to myself in my head, I don't want to be upgrading this crap, let me play the game. Now, before I'm dubbed as impatient, allow me to justify it. I do play games like Mass Effect where it's basically listening to text, and I even occasionally enjoy a text adventure, but it doesn't have much place in an action game, or at least not in the way it's done here. It's so undesirable to feel obligated to put yourself into a pause screen to choose from a long list of boring upgrades and then return to the game. The key to making this enjoyable and actually exciting and have the player positively anticipate this in an action game is to make the effects of the upgrade decision tangible. The guns succeed, mostly, I'll come to this later, and the armor fails here. When choosing an upgrade for the guns, the difference can be told clearly by unpausing the game and using the gun. It's tangible. Choosing an armor upgrade, like taking less environmental damage, payoff is an instant. It's intangible. Dread is a word a bit too harsh, but not much of a misapproximation of the feeling I got when I had to read through five different trees of armor upgrades. The tree only somewhat justifiable was dexterity, and even that's a stretch. Doom would have benefited from straight up removing the armor upgrade system to begin with. If nothing else were done at all except removing it, Doom would have increased in game quality. 
I can hear the comments already saying, if you don't like it, then don't use it. Nobody's forcing you. But there is optimal strategy. The exception I make to this is something like the chicken hat in Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Pain. I will never use that because it feels like cheating, but using a developer-encouraged upgrade system woven tightly into the core gameplay loop doesn't feel like cheating at all, but it doesn't feel engaging either. Bayonetta works the menu system well. It's also a fast-paced action game, but when you want to purchase a new attack combo, for example, you enter the gates of hell. It's a completely different setting from the rest of the game, and the music changes as well. It's normally composed of very energetic orchestral tunes, but the Gates of Hell features soft, down-tempo jazz. It places the player in the mental environment of calmness, so there are no pretenses of trying to remain high energy or engaging in exactly the same way that combat is. This is how to manage menu navigation and item browsing successfully. I used the combat shotgun the most out of any other weapon, especially in the first half of the game. Its damage is appropriately balanced, just like most other guns. I never felt that it should have done either more or less damage considering how far away it was from the target. I never felt gypped out of a kill or overpowered, and most of all, it felt like a shotgun anytime I used it. The fire rate combined with the damage, the loudness of firing a shell, and the reaction of the demons all contributed to how pleasant it feels to use it and perhaps why I used it so much in the first half of the game when there were a couple other guns to use was how accessible it is, which is why I hypothesized that other players had a similar experience to me in this regard. It was easy to use and easy to tell when you were being effective with it. It also helps that it's the first gun you get outside of the pistol. When it comes to the upgrades, the explosive shot was many times more useful than the charged burst and why it's really the most viable and best modification for the combat shotgun. The explosive shot fires a small explosive round very similar to how a rifle in real life would have a grenade launcher attachment like an M203. The charged burst allows you to fire three shells rapidly for extra damage. The burst falls short literally because it falls short and the explosive shot does not. The burst is still constrained by the range of a shotgun shell or at minimum its perceived range by the player. The mod is still used like the shotgun in its default firing mode but with a bit more damage. The explosive shot, however, adds significant range to the gun. It doesn't travel in a straight line, but it arcs, so aiming slightly higher into the air accounts for the drop of the explosive. Managing this slight difference makes the combat shotgun much more diverse and useful for longer stretches of time. In an open area, using the default mode is suitable for enemies nearby, whereas the explosive shot works great on enemies far away or stronger ones that require a bit more damage to dispatch. Not only is this mod more useful, but also much more fun to use. Running around the battlefield with a shotgun is less stressful and more enjoyable when having a longer ranged alternative immediately available. It can also stagger an enemy on occasion, which grants a window of time where the demon is completely incapable of dealing damage. The explosive shot beats the charge burst regarding the upgrade path also. The only improvements to the burst when fully upgraded are changing the rates at which it is used and a conditional damage enhancement. In order of unlock, there's the speedy recovery, rapid fire, quick load, and power shot. Respectively, they reduce recharge time between bursts, increase the burst's fire rate, and reducing the loading time. The mastery upgrade adds a damage buff to the next burst if all three shots from the first burst land on a target. Although Doom is fast paced and the less time one spends waiting on the gun is the more time using it on demons, these upgrades are too in school and practice to be very worthy of the points spent. For a shotgun, it still feels weak to use and too overshadowed by its alternative to justify its use. The improvements to the explosive shot buff times and damage in a more meaningful and useful way. The four enhancements are speedy recovery, bigger boom, instant load, and cluster strike. Respectively, again, they reduce the recharge time between shots, increase explosion radius, and remove the loading time for a shot. The mastery upgrade includes small cluster bombs that deal more damage by scoring a direct hit. It's evident even by the upgrade descriptions, combined with the inherent perk of having a ranged projectile on a shotgun, that you would only be wasting your time and points pursuing the charged burst. Changing how the burst behaves when upgraded though can make it more interesting and lend to more varied gameplay. For example, if the mastery ability granted a chaffing effect after successfully landing all three shots, that would inject more tactic into the gameplay. 
In this case, it would be more worthwhile to not use that shot immediately and save it for a greater demon like a Baron of Hell. Stunning the Baron will grant a moment to either attack it or attempt to eliminate other surrounding demons. It's not a terribly deep or comprehensive addition, but it shouldn't be because that might slow down the gameplay or insert too much decision making into an otherwise quickly played game. In contrast to the intricacies of the combat shotgun, the super shotgun offers a simple alternative. Firing it consumes two shells of ammunition, but both fire simultaneously requiring a reload after every shot because it's a double barrel shotgun. The advantage to this is a huge damage increase compared to the combat shotgun, and that's all you get. And that's perfectly fine. Faster reload, uranium coating, and double trouble decrease reload time, allow shots to go through enemies, and allow the ability to fire twice before reloading. They aren't terribly inventive upgrades, but they don't need to be, because when the super shotgun is needed, it's to output massive amounts of damage at once. You get right what's on the tin. Looking at both of the shotguns side by side, it's apparent that the combat shotgun is more useful more frequently. Its greater range, rate of fire, and alternate firing mode make its uses more diverse where the super shotgun really only has one purpose. That's not to say that the super shotgun isn't worth using, because it absolutely is. I used it often, but I had to put myself in situations where it would be useful. I did this more often than waiting for the opportunity to use it by chance, and it was very fun and engaging to use that way. Flying around the area with the haste rune using the super shotgun is one of the more deadly combos. It's also very satisfying using it on lesser enemies or enemies close to death because the subsequent gore caused by the super shotgun never gets old. I don't know why I dedicated so much time to the shotguns. Maybe I was just tickled by them. I certainly won't dedicate much time for the other guns. I do think this discrepancy is a testament though to how inconsistently the upgrade system is successful. I don't have much to say because they're all fun to use and have a solid feel to them, but nothing is so special to go into more detail for. However, I am going to add a quick note about the plasma gun. Looking at the plasma rifle from Halo 3, it feels like a heavy gun. It appears small when holding it in first person, but the deep sound of the plasma shot and the small recoil on each shot and the reaction time from the enemies really contributes to its weight. The plasma gun feels light by comparison to the other guns, but pitch shifting the sound of the shots from the plasma gun down would make it match the weight of the rest of the guns. It's not a spectacularly inspiring gun to use. Oftentimes I used it because I thought it was being neglected, so I switched to it out of guilt more than anything. There is another form of killing demons other than weapons though. The glory kill feature allows you to kill an enemy by meleeing them, granting a small drop of health. Obtaining an upgrade drops armor as well. The enemies will flash blue when this is an option, and orange when it's almost expired and the enemy returns to its default state. It's a great addition since it encourages the player to move around the battle arena. Staying at one spot isn't a viable strategy anyway, but including the additional incentive of gaining health and possible armor, but traveling everywhere lends more movement to hostile engagements. The way it was executed is ideal as well. You simply press the melee button once in some animation that never lasts more than a second or two at most plays, killing the demon in a gory and gibbing satisfaction. There's no quick time event that's activated once the melee is performed, nor is there some other button sequence that's required. It's a simple and clean way of facilitating movement and preventing combat from becoming stagnant. The guns are placed intuitively on the weapon wheel, grouping massive damage dealing guns together, the shotguns together, and rifles together. For example, if the super shotgun was being aimed for on the wheel but was slightly missed and landed on the combat shotgun, it's not exactly what was wanted, but the approximation is close enough that it's not as detrimental as wanting a shotgun and getting a rocket launcher. This works out similarly for the large guns. Accidentally getting a gauze cannon instead of a rocket launcher is not as much of a problem as getting a pistol. Another well-implemented function of the wheel is how the wheel appears when a weapon is about to be chosen. Holding down the weapon wheel slows down the gameplay a great deal, like entering VATS in Fallout 4, to allow the player to select a weapon if they're not sure what they want yet or haven't memorized the gun placements. However, if you're quick enough, you can hold it down for just the right amount of time and point in the direction of the gun you want, and you will switch to that weapon without neither the game slowing down or the weapon wheel appearing on the screen. This is a great trick for more advanced players to get what they want. It only helps them and it doesn't hurt new players in any way. Details are polished brilliant sometimes, and this is unquestionably one of those times. 
Reloading is also treated brilliantly in the sense that there is no reloading. A game like Call of Duty couldn't get away with this because it's based so much in reality, but Doom isn't, so it can omit a reload function and benefit from it. Removing this function allows a player to focus more on navigating the environment and shooting demons, making the gameplay feel tighter and less bogged down by unnecessary additions. Clambering over obstacles is treated equally as well, barring my comment from earlier. Overall, I scored a very pleasant experience with Doom, and I had plenty of fun with it. It's a very polished game, but one that makes a great example of how caring for some details would drastically improve the quality of the design and the experience for the player. It also had some wasted potential in the face of intelligent decisions, which was disappointing. If you're like me and you're looking for a fast-paced shooter to diversify your gaming experience, or you play shooters regularly and want to add a valuable experience to your portfolio, turning to Doom won't be considered a condoomable game choice.